Sam Cedar on the majority report. Emma Vigeland out today. It is a pleasure to welcome back to the program Bill McKibben, contributing writer at The New Yorker, founder of thirdact.org, among other organizations in the past. Uh, Bill, good to see you. I know uh, we're talking to you uh, in Vermont. I just wanted to uh, uh, check and see. Uh, there was uh, anticipated a lot of flooding. There was a lot of flooding last year you guys had as well um, uh, in, a, in a similar situation. Um, uh, just, uh, you know, I'm glad we got power. Snow, we had snow that turned to a driving rain up here in the mountains. So it's not supposed to be what's happening in January, but there you go. Brave new world. Yeah. Um, and, and disturbing. And, uh, you wrote a piece, um, I guess it was about 10 days ago about the odd silence that we saw about the, the, the hottest year on record and just i guess it was just a day or two ago uh capricus i think it is um uh the european uh uh climate organization uh came out with that this was the hottest if you in include january to january january said the the hottest 12 months in as far as they could tell about 125,000 years um maybe more but certainly uh in terms of our civilization um and where people have been living and how they've been living w talk about like where we're at I and mean, because you and i i think i've interviewed you over the past 15 years or so maybe more where we're at in terms of the way our society at least in this country uh, and, and, and perhaps across like you know sort of uh the the industrialized world is sort of digesting or not digesting this information well i mean it is somewhat big news, 125,000 years. I mean, that takes us back even before the beginning of podcasting. Yes. And um, it's, uh, um, you know, I mean, in some ways, it seems like by far the biggest thing that happened in 2023. Um, but it's not at the top of the news. And in part, that's because, well, perhaps because it moves a tiny bit too slowly for the news to quite understand, though it's moving in the geological blink of an eye, uh, and in part because there's been a long, long campaign of obfuscation and confusion about what's going on here. We're past the point where there are, aside from Donald Trump, many real climate deniers out there anymore, but there are plenty of climate delayers, and that's what the fossil fuel industry has become. Uh, the news today is that they've launched an eight-figure ad campaign in the U.S. just to uh, remind people that we need to keep producing oil and gas, which they do need to keep reminding people because we now live on a planet where sun and wind provide cheaper power. Uh, and if people actually figured that out, we'd be making quicker headway than we are. We're beginning, thanks to things like the Inflation Reduction Act, to get some traction in that transition but it's not going fast enough to catch up with the physics of climate change. So uh, the fight goes on. And I think 2024 is likely to be even warmer than 2023. So I'm afraid there'll be plenty of opportunity to continue making this case. What, what has struck me is that it is becoming m more explicit in terms of like the cost associated, like the material cost associated in real time with uh climate change i mean like i say you know uh you're you we weren't sure if we you would have power to have this conversation this is not the first time that vermont has been hit by like you know sort of massive floods um the the there is no snow in the vast majority of new york state that lasts more than a couple of days on the uh, on the ground uh but meanwhile in the the midwest they're having uh, incredibly extreme weather we, we have floods rapidly. We have fires rapidly, you know, uh, more often. Um, like the, it's almost like there's a slight disconnect on some level. Uh, uh, or is it that the, we haven't figured out a way to align the incentives that are associated with the costs of, you know, I mean, obviously they're much more extensive for other places. But like within the context of American society, have we not aligned the incentives of costs with understanding that we, that we need to in, in invest in or de-invest uh, to, to mitigate these costs in the future? 
Does that make sense? Uh, absolutely. I think one of the places where we may uh, finally see that disconnect closing, and I think this may be one of the sleeper stories of this year, is in the insurance industry. Um, they're beginning to write off whole states that they won't write coverage for anymore because climate risk has just gotten too large. If you can get coverage, the cost is going up, you know, doubling, tripling, so on and so forth. Um, and I think that that's kind of bringing home and will continue to bring home some of this message for people. The good news is that there's something we can do about it. As I say, renewable energy is now the cheapest form of energy we've got. So if we built it out quickly, we couldn't stop global warming. We're, that's not on the list of options, but we could slow it down to the point where we might be able to cope as a civilization with the pace of change. At the moment, we're just racing ahead and uh, all the auguries are, are tough. I mean, 2023 should have taught us that. Uh, even in, you know, relatively safe places like New York or Washington, we spent much of the year breathing the smoke from those tremendous fires in Canada. So there's really no escaping now what's happening. I will say that the, um, that the Biden administration faces a real opportunity right now. Uh, this big drive that's um, been happening all fall to get them to put a pause on building new export terminals for LNG is coming to a head. And uh, there'll be civil disobedience outside the DOE in February. And if the Biden administration does the right thing here and says, we're pausing the permitting of this stuff uh, until we can get good new, not decade old numbers about uh, the economic and environmental impact. If he did that, I think he'd have a credible case to make for having done more than any of his predecessors to take on dirty energy. It's a pretty low bar, uh, but he would, I, I think, clear it because otherwise the ongoing build out of this stuff is so extraordinary. Um, in 10 years time, if the industry gets everything they want, American LNG will be producing more greenhouse gas emissions than everything that happens on the con continent of Europe. So we've really got to rein this in. And, and I think Biden is capable of doing it. And I think if he does, he may be able to recoup some of the enthusiasm that he lost among especially young voters when they pulled that bonehead move and approved the big willow oil complex up in Alaska. So we're hopeful. This is a big year for a lot of reasons, obviously. All right, and we should just say that's February 6th to 8th uh, at the Department of Energy. Um, and, and you were one of the, um, uh, I guess, uh, the uh, signatories of, uh, of, a, of, a, of a letter that was sent and, and a call for that uh, sit-in uh, with other uh, activists as well. Um, we, I was going to ask you within that context of, like, you know, Biden, because at, at this right now my understanding is we are producing more oil than we have ever produced. Yeah, um, I mean, this is this is mostly the hangover of permits granted in the Obama and Trump years. And but yes, look, uh, uh, and so it's time for real choices. America went to Dubai with every, all the other countries of the world last month and signed a piece of paper saying the time has come to transition off fossil fuels. There's no definition of the word transition that includes building a vast new fleet of export terminals designed to last 50 years. Um, so Will you explain serious. that to us? I mean, walk us through, because I, I think like when we say uh, LNG build out, like where this is we're talking liquefied natural gas where does it where does it come from how does it get to these facilities where are these facilities proposed and the idea is that if you build a facility that's going to last for 50 years it's going to be used for 50 years yeah, that's because exactly right. the investment has already been made and, and this they is need all to that, recoup so this is all that fracked gas from the permian basin mostly louisiana and texas and that's right next to the Gulf Coast. So they're building these big export terminals to take this stuff off, mostly to Asia. Um, and in the process, of course, they drive up the price of natural gas for Americans who still need to use it for heating and cooking. Uh, so it's a loser all the way around unless you happen to be an oil company. And then it's, you know, a great way to get rid of your 
excess inventory of fracked gas. Um, the greenhouse gas implications are extraordinary, and so are the environmental justice problems close to home in Louisiana and Texas. And that's why people have been doing such a great job of building coalitions down there. And finally, happily, uh, the national environmental movement sort of catching on and backing them up. So I think it's the biggest uh, national environmental fight probably since maybe since the Keystone or Dakota Access pipelines in a way. But I think it's a place where Biden has great opportunity to do the right thing. Um, Jennifer Granholm just needs to say, look, um, after the hottest year in 125,000 years, we're going to pause and take a look and come up with a new set of criteria for determining what's in the public interest and not. And if they do that, honestly, they'll never build another one of these things. And that would be excellent. Can I walk through a little bit of what that public interest is and understand the, the dynamic here? So you have these frackers, they have all of these, uh, the, this excess uh, liquid uh, natural gas that they have, which of course drives the price down if it's used domestically, uh, because we already have the mechanism to get it to people uh, within, with, within domestically. But if they, if they build these export facilities, it's basically like um them in they they've invested now in something that uh gives them more reason to punt, to uh to mine more i mean to uh, drill more to uh yeah. it, it, and the real problem is sam that, that if you keep providing this endless flood of cheap lng to the rest of the world it undercuts the transition to solar and wind which is what we desperately need so uh, the, the fight is on it's a hard fight um, but a winnable one. Uh, people can go to stoplng.org, I think, um, uh, for more details. And if you're in the D.C. area, to come help on February 6, 7, 8. Um, we're hoping that we can call the whole thing off because they do the right thing in the meantime. Um, but we're preparing to go down there. Uh, it always feels foolish to me to have to end up in handcuffs to try and get our leaders to pay attention to physics. But Sometimes that's what it takes. And if it's what it takes, then uh, uh, willing to do it. <laughs> but it also it also seems like, I mean, just from the most crass sort of like uh, political incentives, um, if that permitting is delayed, it will mean that uh, there is pressure on these um, LNG uh, producers to get rid of some of their excess stock, it seems to me, it would drive it would be, prices down for Americans. It would be a real. It would be an actual inflation reduction act. Right. I mean, it would. It would. It would. And and I would imagine going into an election year, again with the most crass sort of like uh, hurt, incentive structures. Um, that's something Biden would want to do, and it and it gives. I, I guess like the idea that it's not already happening that way gives an idea to the forces array uh, uh, um, uh, hey, aligned. Big oil, is, big oil is big. They got lots of money. They got lots of friends. Uh, cross them at your peril. Um, but there's a lot more voters who care about uh, the future of the planet than there are who care about the future of Exxon's balance sheet. So uh, hopefully we'll make some progress. I've got to jump, Sam. To okay, yes. Go, uh, go uh, all of this. We will but, put a uh, link to uh, stoplng.org on our uh, podcast and absolutely. website description. And Look, thanks so if much. If anyone's keeping their powder dry, you know, this is the time. 125,000 years. Uh, we're seeing some new stuff that no humans have ever seen before. So let's take it seriously. All right. Thanks so much, Bill McKibben. Always a pleasure. Take care, brother. Bye bye. -bye.